All right, hello everyone, bonjour tout le monde, and welcome to the Deindustrialization and the Politics of Our Time live podcast recording, which uses the film Billy Elliot as an entry point to discuss gender in the context of deindustrialization and deindustrialized communities. To situate you, we are streaming on YouTube live from Concordia University Sports Space, which is located on unceded indigenous lands in Jojage, Montreal. This is a public space that connects people to the projects, initiatives, and dialogues and development across Concordia University. Uh, if you are joining us via Zoom, welcome, welcome. You are more than welcome to jump in uh, via the chat or with a raised hand if there's a chance for a Q&A engagement with our panelists here. And if folks are in the space with us today, welcome in. Once again, if you'd like to jump in, just let us know by raising a hand and we'll get one of these handheld mics to you so that we can hear you on the stream. Okay, without further ado, I'll pass it over to our moderator, Brad, and our panelists. Welcome in. Oh, hi everybody. Uh, welcome uh, to this exciting live recording, uh, live from Montreal, um, uh, of the Deindustrialization and the Politics of Our Time podcast. Um, we are going to be uh, relatively informal today, but just before I get uh, uh, started with, you know, uh, introductions and uh, all of those things, we're going to just set the stage for all of you uh, by playing a little clip from uh, from Billy Elliot. So uh, get out your Kleenexes and hold on to your hats. <laughs> right then, lads, now give it all you got. Round one. Well, don't you stand there, Elliot. Thinking of the Royal Ballet School. Aren't you a bit old, Miss? Not me, you. Ballet. What's wrong with ballet? Lads do boxing or wrestling, not ballet. Perfect. All right, so welcome everybody. Um, my name is Fred Burrell. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Cape Breton University and a recent graduate uh, of the doctoral program in history here at Concordia. Uh, I'm a, an affiliate of the Deindustrialization of the Politics of Our Time um, Transnational Research Partnership, which is, uh, as we'll be exploring more today, um, uh, a research partnership of scholars and uh, working class institutions and museums uh, from across uh, seven different countries, uh, looking at uh, the long term impacts on working class communities of deindustrialization. Uh, I'm joined today by four guests, four amazing guests, uh, who I'm going to introduce all, all in a block and then we'll get right into things. Um, so, first, uh, Amanda Marie Witt. Uh, Amanda Marie was born and raised in Washington State and has lived all over the United States, most recently in Brooklyn, New York, before joining us here in Montreal. Um, they're an MA student in uh, Concordia's Department of History, uh, a third generation bartender and a first generation college student. Uh, their graduate work focuses on the implications and relationships that developed through tipped work and the ways that tipped labor exists on the border of the formal and informal economies. Uh, Lauren Laframboise, uh, to my left, is uh, or was just until very recently the Associate Director of Deindustrialization and the Politics of Our Time. Um, Lauren finished her MA at the Center for Oral History and Digital Storytelling here at Concordia. Uh, her work focuses on deindustrialization in the apparel manufacturing industry in Montreal, with particular attention to the intersections of social reproduction, immigration, resistance, and disability in traditionally gendered industrial work. Uh, Lauren is now uh, working on her PhD here at, at Concordia. Uh, Liam Devitt uh, is a writer, activist, and graduate student uh, based 
here in Giojage or Montreal. They are in their second year of their MA uh, in history at Concordia University, uh, studying histories of queer youth amidst deindustrialization uh, in Cape Breton. Um, finally, last but not least, uh, we have uh, direct from uh, Scotland via Berkeley, uh, our friend and scholar Amber Ward, uh, who is a PhD student in modern history at the University of St. Andrews in Fife, Scotland. Uh, Amber's thesis inquires into the relationship between deindustrialization and cultural and ideological transformation. Focusing on the ex-industrial communities of central Fife uh, and using oral history, her project gathers historical memories belonging to a wide breadth of ex-industrial uh, community categories, including those of ethno-linguistic, gendered, and LGBTQ plus community forums. So uh, I had never heard of Billy Elliot, uh, <laughs> which, I, which I'm ashamed to admit now that I've seen the film and realize uh, how important it is to discussions of gender and sexuality and, and deindustrialization. Until Liam was talking uh, this summer, we were uh, together at um, a conference in Germany in the Ruhr Valley talking about deindustrialization. And Liam was presenting on, uh, they, they were challenging the field of deindustrialization studies to, to think about queerness um, in, in, in conversation with uh, working class experience. Um, and they were referencing uh, Billy Elliot. So, um, so for those of you who don't know, who might be like me, uh, Billy Elliot uh, is set during the 1984 miners' strike in, in Durham in the UK, which obviously is a, it's a pivotal moment in, in, in Thatcher's push to destroy working class institutions. Um, and it contrasts a sort of inspirational story of a young working class boy who wants to be a ballet dancer with the tough traditional masculinity of his father and brother uh, who are minors on the picket line. So I wonder, maybe we can start with Liam, um, if you could speak to what you think is at play or what, what, what's being served by the juxtaposition of these, of these two forces. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think, yeah, like, so like, like Fred said, Billy Elliot is such a rich text in the way that it's able to sort of get at all of these sort of different complex aspects of deindustrialization in the UK. But this is, it's the thing that's very interesting is that the, this film came out in 2000, right? So at this time, um, uh, you know, neoliberalism and deindustrialization is really, really set in. Uh, in the British context, uh, Tony Blair is prime minister, so you have this kind of um, neoliberal third way social democracy where, you know, it, Billy Elliot is very interesting is that it's sort of trying to be like, yes, you can do feminine labor, and it might be the actually the only way to save your community uh, is sort of the weird, not perfectly great thing about it is that it's sort of this weird little neoliberal parable of how to save your community is through your own individual talent, gender norms be damned, is I guess at least my read of the film. But it gets at all of these things because you have this sort of non-traditional household where there's a missing mother, um, uh, either it's, it's, there's, 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 there's lots of different things that sort of break open like how exactly deindustrialization might, we, we, we might think deindustrialization and working class communities exist, but then it's ultimately in service of this really, really, you know, kind of neoliberal narrative, I guess. So that's my, I guess, in, initial take on why this is an important film to think about when we're thinking about these histories. Interesting. Thanks, Liam. Does any, who else wants to jump in on this question? Amber, yeah. Yeah, no, ahead. I completely agree. I thought it's a very specific kind of writing of history as well like and history of like thatcherism and the minor strike i thought that they used kind of that personal narratives and personal stories um in a way where you had like billy obviously wants to go off to ballet school and then you have his dad and his brother who are initially really hostile towards it but then it's kind of as the sort of i think it's it's like when they go back to work and the strike is over that they then start to be like, oh, actually, maybe we should support you. And like the whole, the first time it's when, like, I think the dad goes to scab because he wants to find the money to let his son go off to kind of be who he is as an individual. So it's a very, in terms of writing with theory, 
it's actually quite well done. It's just a very horrible version <laughs> <laughs> of history that they tell was kind of my take from it. Oh, interesting. Uh, Lauren, what do you think? <laughs> um, yeah, I thought that it was really a, an interesting film. I had heard of it and had heard specifically of the musical. Um, I hadn't seen the film or the musical before. And so last night it was the first time that I had seen it. Um, very interesting. Something that I thought was, I guess, maybe an interesting point to think about with this is like the way that homophobia is represented in relation to working class communities. and. I think that somebody could realistically watch that film and think, oh, homophobia is something that only exists among working class communities or are especially prone to being homophobic. So, yeah, I think that there's an interesting sort of class politics going on there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's this also there's this scene at the end, right, where his uh, his friend who was queer when he was a child comes to see him at the ballet at the end. And it's, it's kind of like uh, subtext i guess you know that his friend has found uh uh you know a, a kind of a place to be himself when once he's in london right once he's out of the working class community amanda what's what do you think is that is at work uh, here um, yeah, um, so this guy okay uh so sorry uh so there's I definitely thought about the kind of ideas of the homophobia, but also how it's like, because it's not, I think about gay sex when it comes to these things, like it definitely, it's like, what is it? Oh, this sounds weird. Uh, it's also kind of about like what it stands for in terms of the way that the young man is going to interact with uh, his community and his, his family, right? Is because this is like, you know, as being the exceptional child for both like, the sexuality and um, their like skill, they are going to live a life apart from that community. Uh, but also there's like definitely in the early parts of it, when you see this kid like reaching and kind of starting to change, like there's a lot of rate, like anger from the brother and the father. And a lot of that I think re represents this like type of resentment that happens with families where things maybe aren't going as well and then like somebody is trying to do something different and it's like we don't have money for doing something different like you know so that was kind of something that struck me where you know there is like this kind of resonance that i've seen with other kind of films and media that represent uh like working class communities and may also intersect with gender so yeah totally um No, I'm on. Good. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, in, in one of the things that we're trying to do in in, in the in the deindustrialization of the politics of our time uh, project is 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 bring fresh perspectives or challenge the ways that uh, scholars have generally talked about deindustrialization and, and and working class communities. So I wonder if uh, you know, and each of you are doing that in your own work from different perspectives. Uh, I wonder if you, you know you could just tell the audience uh, a little bit about yourself and what what your work is about and and what you think this brings to the broader study of the industrialization. Um, Lauren, do you want to start? Yeah. Okay, now it's working. Um, so yeah, my my research is on. Um, deindustrialization in the clothing industry in Montreal and New York City. Um, and so I have a focus on um, gendered and immigrant experiences of closures. Um, and sort of how I came to that research is that I lived in the kind of formerly working class but rapidly gentrifying neighborhoods that were kind of the center of the historic garment industry in Montreal and found that the kind of lens of deindustrialization was a really good way of understanding, um, you know, both being able to understand the histories of the spaces that I was living in, but also the changes that were very, you know, rapidly affecting the neighborhoods that I was living in. Um, so yeah, that's a bit about my research. Yeah, um, I think in terms of my research, so I study the ex-mining communities of Central Fife uh, in Scotland, 
uh, which is near the University of St Andrews, which is where I'm based, but it's also um, a bit like you, Lauren, I kind of had, I, I'm from the community, so I kind of had that connection there too. Um, I look at deindustrialization um, kind of outside of the workplace, if that makes any sense at all. So outside of um, kind of locations of production. So I go out and I use oral history. I talk to community organizations and kind of ask about um, kind of how they feel that things have changed um, over recent decades. And so it's looking at to see how the period of deindustrialization might also have intersected with things like transformations in cultural norms and uh, kind of what we do kind of in our social life. So um, yeah, that's kind of my, my research. Great. Yeah, uh, for me, the, the bit around, I guess, um, uh, sort of queerness, sexuality is really central to my work. And I work on Cape Breton, which is of course uh, in Nova Scotia, former steel and coal region um and one of the sort of uh sort of not maybe one of one of the big questions of my research that i guess ties really directly into billy elliott is a sort of question of leaving the community and migration because in billy elliott like in order for him to sort of you know succeed or to have hope it's all very much tied directly to getting into the ballet school in london and you know that's a very common narrative for both people who, you know, grow up in deindustrialized communities, that the only way to, you know, you know, you sort of have a, a good life now in this sort of context is to leave and go to go to a city, go to a different resource community, especially perhaps in the case of people from Cape Breton going, you know, across the country to work in the oil sands uh, in Alberta, where where I'm from. Um, and or, or or going to the city so it's and of course queer people have the same thing if they perhaps grew up in perhaps a socially conservative smaller region or town leaving is a big part of that sort of narrative and of course the thing is is that for both people who you know are queer and or grew up in deindustrialized areas there's also a bit of you know an impulse of people perhaps not wanting to leave Right, because you know this is you know not necessarily something that they think they would want, right? Because this belongs to them, and they don't feel like they have to go. Whereas with Billy Elliot, it's very much like him leaving the community is sort of portrayed as the natural progression of what would happen to both him and the future of the community, because he's very much portrayed as the community's last hope. So in my research, it's sort of like trying to tease out these sorts of. Um, distinctions that also goes into sort of Lauren's point about gentrification, right? Because of course we talk about sort of queer people and gentrification in interesting and perhaps not great ways. Um, uh, but it's sort of like even then when we're talking about perhaps gentrification, we're talking about sort of gay neighborhoods and cities, deindustrialization is also there, right? In terms of like what are the buildings that are being now occupied by, you know, these sorts of new communities and this kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot here, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, so for me, I think the intersection um, that I was thinking about with my work is I'm really focused on the idea of like bartenders and service industry workers as observers of deindustrialization. So how kind of their day to day when every person that they interact with uh, loses their job. And I think that there's uh, one thing that's a big element of that is those are people who tend to be put into a caregiving role. So very, very much women, but also, you know, gay men uh, will also take these jobs as well and kind of have that role in their community. So you can kind of imagine this like alternate story where like uh, Billy is in fact very uncoordinated and ends up staying in the town and like working at the pub and like everyone kind of knows, but they're kind of just like, oh, like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so like that's, uh, yeah. So like when I think about like why people interact like how people interact with um deindustrialization and how like you know gender kind of comes into that like there is definitely this idea of like well if you're not this like exceptional special boy like you are going to have to perform gender in these like different ways and kind of navigate that a little differently i'm sorry yeah yeah, yeah. no that's uh that's really interesting so all of you have touched on in different ways i would say um you know, how the, 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 the narrative of sort of the heavy industry, uh, mostly working class male uh, population, uh, which, you know, has been kind of the ways that we've thought about 
um, deindustrialization. Uh, and, and you know, we think about industries like coal and steel, and in Canada and the U.S., talk about auto workers, um, um, and that has been sort of the portrait uh, in, in the scholarship, even for scholars who are focused on on gender. You know, they've been thinking about kind of like the crisis of of masculinity for for male working class people who have who have lost their ability to be breadwinners. Um, so I guess I wonder what what do you think is lost uh, in this? Uh, um, what do, what do you think is hidden? What what perspectives do 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 we miss out on? Um, and what kind of do we stand to gain from thinking about job loss in in other forms of industries or uh, or focusing on the experience of other sorts of workers? Um, Amanda, yeah, please. Uh, yeah. So something that brings to mind is like. Um, another another film, The Full Monty, uh, where there's a lot of that idea of the like job loss is also kind of being this like, you know, I think specifically there is even one character who becomes impotent because of their job loss and is like not able to like perform their husbandly duties, right? Uh, but I think that there's like very, it's very rare that we look at that type of anger and like both kind of in like cultural or like discourse conversations, but also in media and like really connect it to like job loss in a really meaningful way. And in a way that's like, um, maybe instead of being like a bit patronizing is like actually kind of engaging with the complexity of that. Um, but also like, I wonder, and I don't see this, but I would, I would wonder if that doesn't just happen to men, right? Like, you know, because I think we have a fair amount of examples of that, but we don't see like how that takes place for women who are breadwinners or, you know, people in like non-traditional relationships or like gender expressions, so. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else want to jump in on that question? Yeah, go ahead, Amber. Yeah, no, I think. Definitely, yes. Oh, yeah. yeah, I think that definitely those kind of histories that we have of like coal and steel they're really really crucial and important kind of in writing our sort of histories of capitalism and understanding how different junctures in kind of recent capitalism have been manifested but also like felt and rationalized by kind of working class actors but i do think that it's kind of always that thing where it's like there are always more perspectives and I wonder as well is that kind of with a bit too much of a focus on certain kind of white male working class actors does have the effect of kind of reproducing this idea that productive, especially manual labor is the most legitimate form of labor, that it is real work when I think we all know that there is a whole host of unpaid, uh, sometimes paid, but usually unpaid labor done in the households upon which capitalism ultimately does rest. Um, not performed by women and men, but I think often gendered as female, like like housework and you know care and and social care, like nursing, the nursing sector too. Um, so I think that um, yeah, there's yeah. you know always room for more perspectives. Is kind of my take on it. Totally, yeah, Leo. Yeah, like I think I think building off of what what Amber says is that like say for like the sort of you know queer example is that it tells us a lot about, you know, it doesn't, it tells us, you know, of course, from like a representational perspective, right, in that sort of very narrow, like, okay, because queer people are marginalized, we should be talking about them, which is like, I think, true and good. But I think the thing is, is that by including that, we actually learn a whole lot more about the history of queer people because of how urbanization and industrialization sort of created um, uh, in many ways, um, the conditions for which sort of queer identities, gay identities can actually form because people are, you know, able to sort of be a bit more, you know, separated from that, you know, from the nuclear family and can rely on uh, wage labor to a degree to sustain themselves and allowing them to have their own sort of identity um, uh, outside of this. And I think by focusing on queer people, it also allows us to, I guess, problematize in discussions of deindustrialization, the household, right? Because a lot of a lot of discussions of gender and deindustrialization um, sometimes you know focus maybe not necessarily on women workers but on women doing reproductive labor, which is to be perfectly clear something that is good and should be done. But then again, once we sort of problematize the household as perhaps a site of contestation 
of deindustrialization itself and not necessarily something that also has to be considered in terms of the, the different pressures that are working within sort of a heterosexual nuclear family. Right. So I think it allows us when we sort of focus on queer workers, I guess, at least for me, this is my thing. And this is why I you know, kind of forced everyone to talk about Billy Elliot. Um, <laughs> um, I, think, I think it tells us a whole lot more about what the picture that we have you know, exactly is. And it allows us to work through these histories in ways that are, I guess, a bit more messy and complicated and aren't necessarily the sort of, I guess, you know, the straight line that Billy Elliot kind of represents to battle loss and then decline. And then maybe you have, you know, a gay son who's really good at ballet and <laughs> it'll be okay. But, uh, but yeah, and even then with the Billy Elliot, they, they, they just, they, they, in the film, they, they, they can't, they can't make him actually gay. Mm -hmm. He has to rebuff every sexual advance. And it's very, very funny because they're like, we have this son that's dancing, but we cannot as a film actually have him show anything. It only has to happen to him. That's just something that I really wanted to say because I think it's very funny about how the film portrays that. But that's my rant out of the way, I guess. Yeah, no, uh, that, that, it is quite striking, actually, mm -hmm. yeah. Lauren, you want to hop on this one? Yeah, um, this is a question that I that I think a lot about um, the kind of space that masculine heavy industry takes up in, um, you know, a lot of both the kind of, you know, study of deindustrialization, but also, you know, popular understandings of what deindustrialization is. I think that a lot of people often have, you know, closed and rusting steel mills in mind or the, the coal mine that closed in their community. Um, but I think that there's a problem there in that it paints a very incomplete picture of what industrial work is. And there are a lot of types of manual and industrial work that primarily women do. Um, so my research on the clothing and textile industry is kind of an example of that. Um, but also, and what I find interesting is that like the textile industry has taken up a lot of space in kind of early understandings of industrialization, but not so much in terms of deindustrialization. And I think that that has a lot to do with, you know, conceptualizations of women's wages as being supplemental to a male breadwinner's wages. Um, and I think that that has kind of, you know, resulted in, in kind of a uh, large focus on kind of masculine heavy industry because you know women's work is you know devalued in, in these types of spaces mm -hmm. yeah um so in all of your answers you've touched on in some ways uh the question of reproductive labor um you know, but would it be in the household or the sort of the emotional labor of being in a bar or uh um i wonder in the course of each of your research um you know, how you, uh, things you've come across, um, either the sort of the ripples in the, in the community uh, setting or the ripples in a family, because, uh, you know, of course, in deindustrialization and the politics of our time, uh, one of our uh, primary research methodologies is oral history. So, you know, we get into these things with people. Um, how, how have working class people talked about uh, these things in the interviews that you've, that you've been able to do so far in your research? I can go ahead yeah. because I have a very ready story oh, that, I love, <laughs> that I love to tell. No, but it's it was like actually really formative in kind of my experience of doing my MA project um, where I was doing an interview with um, an Italian woman who had immigrated to Montreal in the 1960s. Um, and, you know, basically the day after she arrived had gotten a job in the garment industry and, you know, started working right off the bat. Um, and while I was doing the interview, I had prepared all of these questions about her waged work. So, you know, what was it like to be doing piecework? Was that a stressful type of way to work? Um, you know, asking all of these questions that were really, you know, specific about her workplace. And she, I think, got frustrated with me at a certain point and was like, yeah, but it's not just work and for her that meant you know waged work it was also like i had to get up at like five in the morning and make my kids lunches get them to school pick them up from school after work and then she also like sewed all of their clothes at home you know so it for her it wasn't the industrial labor was difficult and it had you know health consequences but it was 
the intensification of her industrial labor in combination with all of her, you know, household responsibilities that eventually, you know, forced her to retire early um, and had these kind of like really long term health implications for her. So that moment in that one interview that I had done was was actually super formative and completely kind of changed the direction of my study to understand that, well, yeah, I had I had had like a very narrow conception of what labor history is that had just thought about wage labor, right? And I think that that was a critical mistake that I realized in that interview space specifically. Oh, wow, that's a great story. Um, anybody else want to share some things from their research? Um, Amanda, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I think that there's a couple things. One is I didn't realize there was some definite uh, cultural universals as far as uh, injury and work. So uh, like, I remember talking, um, sorry, uh, like reading this article, actually, and it was a news article about this woman who had been a long time, uh, like breakfast diner server. And apparently she had a stroke at work and worked for two more hours, and then went to the hospital. Like a, like a minor stroke and it was definitely like you know approached in this newspaper like wow what a tough gal and you're reading this article and you're just terrified and you're like oh my gosh this is so dangerous this is so like uh like you just you can't imagine it but then you remember like okay so this woman like you know works in this specific town uh where there's you know a lot of industry like their you know their husband is probably a logger too like you know, I have stories like my great uncle going to work with like, a, like, you know, a fractured pelvis only taking a week off like these just, you know, there's, you know, less differences than I think we'd expect. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, you know, in the case for, you know, people who are doing like the domestic work of their home, you know, often the women in the family, like, you know, they may be doing these things, they may be in incredible pain, and they're still, you know, taking care of their kids, like, you know, making the lunches, whatever. Um, and then the other thing I found in my research was often women would not recognize their own like entrepreneurship and their own like wage earning labor even as being such a strong contributor to the household. Like, you know, I remember in one interview I was listening to this woman, she's talking and then all of a sudden, you know, she's like, oh yeah, you know, and I like to do ceramics and her daughter pipes up from the other room and is like, mom, you had a ceramic studio where you taught classes for five years. <laughs> and it's just these things of like, um, and also this is a difficulty of interviewing, right? Of like, when you're trying to get people to talk about their own labor, they don't recognize it and therefore they don't know how to bring it up. Mm -hmm. And so that's also like on you to like, try to like pick it out and notice it, right? Cause you're not always gonna have that daughter around. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. It's really hard to make people see like their own work sometimes. Yeah. And what about interviewing in the in the community context? Uh... Yeah. Perfect. Um, yeah. It's um. Oh, it, it's it's been great. I've had so many kind of different, varied kind of um, narratives of recent historical change that have all come out. Um, and something that I found really really interesting. And and when I say this, I'm I'm not a defender of deindustrialization in any way at all. Like. In, in no sense um but something that i found quite interesting that came out across loads of the interviews um was the sense that the period of the industrialization when it came about in the um, local context in the sort of like 1950s 60s onwards actually gave more women opportunities to work yeah. who with the sort of onset of the kind of social democratic settlement in the sort of late 1940s 1950s these women who had worked during one or both world wars who had then been sort of faced with actually once you get married you you don't have a job anymore with deindustrialization which came kind of maybe a few decades after they actually had the opportunity to work again and they actually found that there was more they found that more liberating yeah. and that's not to defend deindustrialization in any way i just think that it's something which when we as we're saying we have this kind of very Kind of masculine image of what deindustrialization looked like is like it, it was it was more complex than that and i think that understanding those nuances and possibly you know the way that different people and people in who have different identifying categories such as gender 
um, were kind of dealt different cards in different ways, I think it's important to kind of understand the transition as a whole. So that was something, I think you talk about like having Lauren having like, you know, moments where you, you learn things that you didn't expect and really like shape your perspective. I think that's been something that's come out of my research. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I suppose that's, uh, you know, we see this sometimes talking about uh, even, even working class people who have lost their industrial job, you know, it comes up in the interview sometimes, like most, most stories about retraining, et cetera, are, uh, are stories of frustration and failure, but not always, you know, sometimes uh, working class people often remind us that the jobs that sometimes academics tend to romanticize were actually difficult and, and dirty and dangerous. And, and yeah, and that's part of the experience too. Uh, Liam, did you want to hop in on that question? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wish I had a fun anecdote to share, but I, I'm, I'll have one in about a month because I'm about to just go and do field work. So I'm, I, I hope I'll have a bunch of anecdotes then to share, uh, knock on wood. Um, but I think to the, the point that Amber, you were making about kind of like the post-war social democratic compromise or the Fordist Accord, whatever, whatever we want to call it, I think there's a bit of a tendency within a, a bit of a tendency. There is a deindustrialization studies, let me speak very definitively, kind of romanticizes that. And that and, re and a return to that is often sort of portrayed. And, and Fred, you've spoken about this before as kind of the, the ultimate horizon of of deindustrialization studies is sort of going back and doing social democracy once again. And, you know, to be clear, you know, full employment for me right now wouldn't be the worst thing in my life, uh, <laughs> to be perfectly clear. And I don't want to I don't want to trash on that too much. But I think we do have to remember, like, you know, who was excluded from that, right? Who was able to access the full benefits of this of this settlement, right? Um, and, and, and what benefits were able to access. And then I think when we're talking about, say, race, when we're talking about queer people, when we're talking about, about women, that begun, begins to sort of, you know, be blown up a little bit. And we can, you know, sort of think about how, you know, that, that sort of industrial labor that we might, you know, want to sort of romanticize, or at least perhaps that, I guess, kind of industrial to use to use the, the the Raymond Williams term that we all love to use structure of feeling that, that we all sort of like really, really sort of latch onto in this field and sort of complicate that a little bit, I think. And um, uh, and then I think from there, we can sort of reshape what the horizon of our, our field is, because I think fundamentally, we all come to this field um, uh, with a want to, you know, sort of, you know, do right by these communities that we may or may not have like a very strong, you know, personal uh, connection to, right? So yeah, I think, I think, I don't, I wish I had more anecdotes personally to share, but I think, I think it just comes down to like, you know, how do we best do this history for, 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 for these communities and, and buy in with these communities? Yeah, thank you, Liam. Well, yeah, sorry. Um, I, uh, I want to turn, uh, uh, oh, so I was going to say, I wanted to turn to the audience and I see Stephen uh, has, has posted a question in the chat. Um, so Stephen asks, uh, what, what does deindustrialization mean to you? Uh, this, this, feel, this feels like a, like a, like one of those uh, blindfolded dating exercises. You know, <laughs> <it's> like, <laughs> is it, do you prefer long walks on the beach or board games? You know, is it, uh, but so what does deindustrialization mean to you? We're going to put you on the spot first, Amanda. Oh, thanks. Thanks for putting me on the spot first. Uh, so I think that something I found very interesting about beginning to study deindustrialization was uh, coming from a region that has experienced a lot of uh, industrial decline. Uh, so I'm from the Pacific Northwest, uh, grew up in logging towns, um, logging, sawmills, timber, uh, all had huge, huge um, reset, like were either closed by the time I grew up or people were like constantly afraid of losing their jobs. Um, at the same time, the brewery, which was another major uh, union employer in our town, also closed down. Um, and there was definitely like this really big sense of insecurity. So for me, when you're studying it, it's also like as a queer person, I also had this experience reading queer theory for the first time, right? It was like, wow, like somebody is explaining this thing that I have had all these feelings about but haven't been able to put words to. And I am able to kind of 
explain and describe things that I knew to be true and I knew to understand, but like it was really amazing and comforting and also very empowering for me to see that there were people like uh, looking at it and describing it really meaningfully. Um, so, but also as far as like what is deindustrialization, it's like, you know, closure um, of an industry. And I think it's very important that when we look at that, we like look beyond the factory gates, right? Um, because A, it's like not even always a factory. Sometimes it's a fishery. Sometimes, you know, sometimes deindustrialization looks like a forest, right? Because it's a forest that is standing and not no longer being logged. Like, you know, it's going to look like a lot of different things, but it's just understanding it as a process, not a place, right? So. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, any, many, many, mo, Liam, yeah. Yeah, um, I think in, in terms of like how I sort of came to this and what this means to me, um, uh, and again, this is ties back to why I'll, I'll um, uh, force you to watch this movie. It really does in some ways start with Billy Elliot, for me at least, in terms of sort of situating this because um, I'm from, I'm, I'm not from a deindustrialized area. I'm from an, I would say I'm from a region that is deindustrializing. I'm from, I'm from Alberta with the oil sands and all of this kind of stuff. And of course, admittedly, I'm from Calgary. I'm not necessarily from like Fort McMurray right up in like, you know, the, the tar sands, but um, it's, it was really interesting coming to work on this research and sort of seeing some certain parallels between, I guess, people in my life, um, uh, and and their sort of um, uh, their 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 sort of labor, and being like, oh, these are distinctly similar to the stories that I've read about, and sort of actually being like, oh no, this is a process that's happening right in front of me, even if I can't see, you know, the full full sort of face of it. I guess if that makes sense, sort of thinking about, I guess, energy transitions and this sort of stuff. Um, and I think for me, like sort of seeing that through the lens of, I guess, you know, sort of migration, seeing that from the perspective of, I guess, being like a young queer person in this sort of area, it, it, it felt it felt a little weird to sort of like look at Billy Elliot and be like, I really relate to this incredibly intensely. Why exactly do I relate to this incredibly intensely? I mean, I don't know. I did do ballet lessons for like a little bit. So I think maybe that's why a little bit. I was terrible at it. I was not Billy Elliot. Uh, I was really bad at ballet um, uh, because uh, I don't know. I think I told my dad that I wanted to dance lessons once. And then my father being like, well, we must start first with a strong classical foundation. Uh, and then it rolled me in um, uh, ballet classes at the community center. So uh, so yeah, that's ballet is, is why I studied Dean Nostralization. <laughs> Amber, yeah. My goodness, what does deindustrialization mean to me? Um, I think, and I really relate to what you guys are saying, and that I sort of ended up coming to what I'm studying, deindustrialization. And it, I think it is, it's based on, I think, growing up in an ex-industrial community um, and finding that this was the field where that gave words and form to inequalities that I had seen around me and had experienced, but didn't have the words for. And so I think that maybe deindustrialization is about trying to understand historical change, but in a way where you foreground local experiences and narratives as autonomous in and of themselves as your sort of point of entry to understand what's going on and from that point you then almost contextualize their experiences and what's going on here with more macro accounts of i don't know global shifts and labor and capital and all these kind of bigger broader narratives um so yeah i i think foregrounding local experiences maybe yeah is maybe what it's about Totally. Lauren. Um, yeah, thank you, Stephen, for this difficult question. <laughs> um, I touched on a little bit when I was introducing my research, kind of how I came to the project by, um, you know, living in the kind of along Boulevard Saint Laurent that, you know, historically divides the eastern part of Montreal from the western part of Montreal. And um, it was basically all the way from, you know, the south up until 
the 40, the highway, um, has been over time kind of dotted with garment factories. Um, so I also came to it by like wanting a deep or wanting to understand local history a little bit better um, because, yeah, I thought that that was an important thing to do. I moved around a lot growing up, so I don't necessarily have a super huge sense of rootedness. Um, I moved around like kind of rural in between suburban Eastern Ontario, but now I'm like, oh, there was a woolen textile uh, kind of manufacturing industry in that area that I had not really paid attention to because that had long closed by the time that I, I was living there. So um, yeah, I think that as Amber is saying, it's this really good way of understanding the way that work changes over time, the kind of um, shift yeah, the relationship between these massive kind of structural problems that are that feel very, very far away, but have a really material impact on people's lives through the type of work that everyone does. So, yeah, I guess that's why it feels important to me. <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. <laughs> um, I want to ask you all about the question of, uh, of violence. Um, so this is something that came up uh, you know, kind of strikingly in the film is that there's several, uh, you know, scenes of sort of familial violence, even though it's, you know, it's quite, <laughs> it's sanitized, but it, but it's still there. Um, and, and the protagonist, uh, as sort of the one who is transcending his own community, uh, is, is not violent, right? Until, until the end, when he kind of gets into the middle class world, and his like first uh, interaction with another kid his own age is to is to deck him in the face, you know, um, and, and and somehow that is supposed to kind of convey working class roots in a way. Um, so I want to ask each of you, uh, kind of, in, in thinking about gender and sexuality in relation to deindustrialization, um, how do you conceive of violence, or how do you work with the the presence of violence, or uh, in a way that is not stereotypical uh, in understanding working class community and family life. Yeah, no, I think this is this is a really big sort of question for me. And um, like thinking, I'll, I'll start with thinking about Billy Elliot and the scene that you mentioned, Fred, at the at the ballet school where um, uh, at this at this point in the film, you know, so this is sort of Billy's you know future in the ballet school is like under question and this fellow auditioner at the ballet school who's i guess at least in my my sense is is is, is much more sort of not just middle class but also like effeminate yeah. this sort of young boy is just like oh billy it's perfectly fine you'll there's another audition next yeah da, da, da. like this kind of kind of way of thinking about it so it's it's not only just sort of like an assertion of like working classes it's also almost playing up a bit more masculinity too in reaction to this and 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 i guess like uh, imperfect word here but like not not gayness i guess um uh so i think that's 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 one of the things there and i think connecting that back to my own research and sort of thinking through billy elliott and sort of these sort of ideas of of, of migration is that whenever any time i tell people not any time but many times i tell people that i'm working on cape breton and i'm doing sort of queer stuff in cape breton a lot of the things that people say is like, oh, well, it's very unsafe there. They all have to leave, don't you know? And it's sort of going like this and just sort of like, oh, will you be safe there? I've had people sort of express concerns for my own personal safety there, right? And like, you know, coming from a part of like the country that is, I would say, socially conservative as well. Like, it's not like, like part of my, like my gut reaction is like, I'll be quite fine. Like, thank you, you don't need to worry about me. But I think it's, it's really interesting because, again, it comes back to this idea of, you know, like working classness and masculinity and homophobia being sort of elided into this one kind of opaque blob for middle class people to sort of gaze into and, you know, think and project their own insecurities onto, I guess, is, is sort of one thing. Um, but yeah, I think, and it comes back to ideas of migration and sort of the ideas like, you know, um, uh, well, they have to leave. I had someone express sort of concern to me is like, well, since you're going there and doing this, I, you can tell these young sort of gay people that it's okay for them to leave. Right. And I'm like, well, that's not kind of the point I want. I want like part of me is to preserve their histories and, you know, show them that it is okay to stay. 
or or to leave like that they should be you know in charge of you know forming their own sort of communities right and this this shouldn't be happening in terms of this kind of casting out so yeah that's i guess my nuanced i guess rant about violence <laughs> yeah thank you um, amanda yeah i mean i think there's also when it comes to violence and like the threat of violence i have it's very conflicting because I have made the choices of where I live based on, you know, having some like home, like experiencing some homophobia based on like my perceived like gender expression and sexuality. Um, and I also know other people who grew up um, around me to kind of have that be the case. But it's also it's changing very quickly. And I think that's something that, you know, there's a couple different like ways to, you know, think about that happening for young people or like young people people who are like leaving an industrialized community or um but also it's like you know there is also this like right now we're in this like kind of like economic violence of even if you want to move to a city you can't afford to yeah. mm -hmm. you know if you are a like young 20 something who is trying to you know experience and be in community with other queer people it is not as feasible as it used to be to do that unless you have like a professional track job right like in order to like get in and be in the city and do those things and so like and that is its own kind of form of violence like it's not it is not the same it's like really hard to put it on the same level as like you know home or like intimate violence right or like to say like okay factory closures are and like these things like do exist in a way where like you put people in a situation where they're like personal safety is at stake because they're going to get evicted and then they're going to have to like live on the streets if they don't have family support and that is also a way to like exist in a society that is like enacting violence on you right like so i'm so sorry i like lost my train of thought but um oh, it is very time. strongly um interacting and i think it's like but yeah, we do definitely have this issue of people will look at the other and like in the city and academia and like professional life like that happens to be people who live in small towns and are different to them in so many ways. Um, and say these are the people who enact violence, not us, and I think it's just important to like not excuse but also recognize like actors of violence for what they are. Yeah, I really like hear what you guys are saying. Like, I have a, had a lot of the same thoughts, especially watching Billy El Elliot last night, um, where there was just there was so much violence in and and anger and aggression in that film, but it was portrayed. It, it was in a it was done in a way where it was like industrial action, and working class communities were associated with violence and aggression and. These were the places where these types of emotions were expressed and where they happened. And as well, I thought that the treatment of children in the, the, the working class communities was just awful. Like, what? That, that's not, that, that, that can't, that is not, oh, I just thought it was, ch children do not go about working class communities. I don't think they ever have been just being shouted at all the time. Like, <laughs> cr crazy. Um, but I thought it was quite interesting too that the sort of, social mobility and middle and upper class spaces tended to be kind of a, like portrayed as associated with love which i thought was very qu quite quite depressing actually um and i thought that it, it just it kind of really chimes with what you guys are saying too is that i feel like it says a lot more about the people who the anthropologizing gaze of the people who create these narratives about how they view the working class communities that they are depicting rather than what was actually going on in these communities in history, you know, in recent history in the 1980s or now. Um, because I think that whilst these are films and narrative, they speak a lot to popular conceptions of ex-mining communities and their recent past. Um, so I think it says a lot about, a lot more about them, <laughs> maybe, yeah. than the people they're showing. Yeah, I'll just maybe pick up quickly on something that Amanda said, which is economic violence or structural violence. And I think that that's kind of one of the main ways that I think about violence in terms of my own work. Um, 
and this speaks to kind of broadening out who we think about when we picture an industrial worker, um, is that the experiences of closures and layoffs, et cetera, are, you know, exp you know, intensified by, you know, multiple different types of marginality. So, you know, gender, race, migration status, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, and I think that structural violence is an interesting way of kind of looking at some of those interlocking kind of forms of um, of oppression. And I think what's also important about deindustrialization and violence or structural violence specifically is that there is a decline in the quality of the work that comes after. So um, if you think about deunionization massively in the United States, but certainly also in Canada, elsewhere, um, so, you know, the erosion of the kind of institutions that are meant to enforce labor laws, et cetera. Um, so deindustrialization doesn't just represent a switch from an industrial economy to a kind of quote unquote service based or creative economy, but it means that there is kind of a decline in the quality of work that kind of yeah, comes after um, industrial labor, in my view. Yeah, absolutely. Um partially Lauren that makes me think about um, you know, the fact that you're all studying in some way or another deindustrialization um, after shutdown right not not deindustrialization during shutdown um, which you know is is I think it's really 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 brilliant and it's something that um, you know not only after shutdown in the lives of people who experience shutdown but but after shutdown you know interviewing mostly people who maybe never worked uh, in, in heavy industry or worked in the plants that were closed. Um, and I want to ask you about that. I want to, I you know, if, if any of you just want to reflect on that, what, it, what do you think is, is the point of doing that? What, what, what are we trying to learn uh, when we're, um, you know, thinking about the long-term impacts of deindustrialization? Um, you know, does it necessarily just in a geographic locale? Are we thinking about transformations uh, of, of class as a whole, of you know, the embodied experience of of the, of the environment when there is no more smokestacks, or all of these things? Um, go ahead. Yeah, I think one of the things that I it's it's, it's a big question that I have in my sort of thinking um, is thinking about, I guess sort of class formation, right? And where that does and doesn't happen in, in, in a deindustrialized community, because there's, there's this one shot in Billy Elliot um, that they revisit to you a couple times. It's where Billy is visiting um, the grave of his, his dead mother and the graveyard is laid out and then behind it is, um, uh, is, 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 the, is, is the coal mine, right? I think that's like very, very like, very heavy handed symbolism in in uh in, in in many ways but then it's like so we have like you know in this sort of popular billy elliott narrative the sort of very much this death of working classness and i think one of the things that i want to think about at least in, in in my research about like sort of talking to sort of queer people who perhaps grew up in or live and live through i guess to use sherry lincoln's term the half-life of deindustrialization is like what is the connection to that sort of industrial class identity and where else like do do people find working classness or not find it right because of course you know and also sometimes when we talk about class formation we perhaps focus a bit too much on industrial labor and not on you know other places we might find class formation like perhaps the household right you know because of course like working class women despite even perhaps you know never necessarily working in factories even though of course many did like lauren um uh lauren lauren lauren, lauren talks about um you know, the household is still a site for that, right? So it's it's sort of, we need to sort of think through, you know, class formation and class deformation to use such a, I guess, to, to invert it. But yeah, I think that's one of one of my things in terms of thinking about that sort of question, so yeah. Amber, you look like you want to say something. Do I? I don't know. Do I? Um, I think that, yeah, looking at, because looking at the industrialization after the fact, essentially, is what we're all kind of doing. I think, does it maybe speak to the fact that, I mean, I think that we're all, you know, 
we all, we all want to do better for the communities that we study. Like we all kind of have that, I don't want to say agenda, but you know, we care a lot about working class people and, and what not. Um, and so does that mean that you have an interest in like kind of, as you say, transformations and change, you know, and so you're kind of, you have this interest, maybe you can tell me if I'm wrong, but you have this interest in, you know, processes. Mm -hmm. and not just what happened but how things changed and what came next and how that can help us to inform what comes now in the future maybe how, and how we can maybe think about building new alternatives now um that was the only little thought i had <laughs> sure, which is obviously something we desperately need to think about right as we're careening towards extinction um, uh, anybody else on this question of studying studying class after shutdown or, or working with working class communities after shutdown? Um, I have a thought on that, which is for uh, the industries or like for a lot of the timber communities, one of the ways that they have tried to kind of revive post um, a lot of the mills closing, because by the way, they are still removing logs. Like if they just don't employ people anymore. Yeah. It's it's all mechanized. So, um, but these areas are like quite hidden. But one thing that happens in the towns is that there's um, often a shift to outdoor recreation and tourism, uh, which changes the nature of the work. So you could have someone who is working as a service worker who previously worked and their regulars were this kind of more stable community that is coming in and out of um, their bar, their restaurant, um, and they're more familiar, but then you're shifting um, these spaces to fulfill the tastes of uh, people who are visiting um, the space as a tourist, um, as like a hiker or whatever. So you have um, the work and the labor changing significantly, not just from the care and emotional labor end, but also on the like what you are serving, what are you cooking, um, you know, learning all the micro brews, uh, describing the, dis the bespoke cocktail. Um, but ultimately these shifts uh, do not result, while they result in maybe like an visibly higher end, uh, like, you know, plating service for like the customer, they do not result in a higher end job. Mm -hmm. There's in fact been a lot of uh, like uh, degradation of the labor within the restaurant sector, um, kind of just like across the board, but especially when places shift to tourism. Uh, so, you know, it's like very interesting to see how that future is happening because, because people are only engaging with it as customers, they don't like think about or really, um, really kind of uh, consider it. They're just like, oh, well, like a lot of people work at this restaurant. So maybe we should make everywhere that used to do logging into a place to go whitewater rafting. And you're like, no, that like does not work. It like so profoundly does not work, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I uh, absolutely. I grew up in a very rural place as well. And it's a, uh, there's nothing more annoying than, you know, like the, the urban tourist who's, who's coming to, you know, spot a bald eagle or whatever. Um, it's a, it's a, it makes for a rough day. Uh, Lauren, I saw you taking notes. Uh. Very observant. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess because I do study like the actual shutdowns and how that happens, but you know, because I am interested in the history of capitalism and the way that that has sort of transformed in this quote unquote post industrial era that we are in in the global north, supposedly. Um, the the clothing industry like right now as you know the global clothing industry has become kind of like a symbol for some of the world's worst labor conditions right and so yeah what i think is important to think about is the relationship that um you know has kind of evolved between the global north and the global south um and a lot of the companies that you know, used to have manufacturing activities in Montreal, still exist in Montreal, but production happens elsewhere where, you know, there are like limited, um, you know, enforcement of labor standards, et cetera. So I think that creates um, a particularly difficult and problematic dynamic between the global north and global south where profits, 
um, are concentrated in the global north, um, you know, at the expense of people's work in the global south. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, that that points towards the fact that even people who live in deindustrialized communities or, uh, you know, I guess post industrial, if they're doing it in, in more of a kind of a middle class consumer way, um, are still engaged in industrial relationships, right? Uh, who their worlds are still structured by industrial labor. Um, I want to just throw it out again to the audience. I have a few more questions, but I want to make sure there's nobody uh, sitting on the internet that that wanted to say something. Uh, I also want to invite the panelists to think about questions that they might like to ask one another. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, so I have one final question, and then I'll, I'll ask each of you to, you know, to, to, to think about uh, the questions that you might like to ask one another. But um, I think sometimes we tend to think about, you know, when we're academics love to kind of like be the next hot thing, you know, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of our theoretical approach or our methodology. We like to say this is this is a, a gap in the scholarship, you know, um, and obviously, unfortunately. Kind of gender and sexuality is clearly a gap in the scholarship uh, in the industrialization studies but how can we do this without uh lauren you touched on this a little bit before but how can we how can we approach thinking about deindustrialization from a gendered lens without it becoming purely additive um you know so there's class plus gender and then you know a few years later maybe we'll add race and then you know if we get really ambitious we'll start talking about ambil ab ability you know but like how, how do we avoid uh, in our in our collective approach and also in our individual scholarship? Liam. Yeah, I think one of the things that I that I worry about with my own work in in terms of in terms of queer people is sort of creating another Billy Elliot within my own work and sort of creating this like kind of exceptional like queer in this sort of context that is sort of valorized while you know people who might you know like um perhaps the billy's parents of the community right the um uh, you know the the quote unquote rest of like you know if we're going to frame it in like the kind of like post 2016 american anxieties around the quote unquote white working class while they get sort of you know put in like even further statically in that sort of like left behind kind of place where like only certain like exceptional kind of you know um uh you know workers or people trying to sort of escape these communities get sort of valorized right and i don't think that's really that's just not I don't think that's really doing right by these communities, right? And that's something that I guess in my own work I, I'm, I'm, I'm anxious about, and sort of in, inadvertently recreating this sort of Billy Elliot, you know, narrative. And I think it happens a lot. I guess it happens a lot in discussions of gentrification, right? Where you know we have like I guess like sort of like you know queer arts communities in you know urban spaces, sort of creating and perhaps you know in 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 a deindustrialized space you know working in sort of studio spaces that perhaps was once a textile mill or something like that and perhaps i'm thinking very much about this city that we're in right now and you know them becoming like this new sort of like beautiful sort of site um uh for people to see and you know something that's advertised on like tourism montreal and all this kind of stuff while actually the displacement that occurs within the community is perhaps you know papered over right so I think that that's, I guess, one of, you know, my concerns, I guess, is that, you know, we can't just have it be this sort of additive thing. We can't have it be like this, you know, oh, look, I found a Billy Elliot kind of thing and sort of like, oh, look, how, how, what, how inspiring, how beautiful. But actually, like, orienting to this is like, what does this actually tell us about how deindustrialization worked and continues to work? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Amber. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I share all these insecurities all the time <laughs> with my own work that um, in sort of, I think we all agree that there is maybe a little bit too much of the essentializing of class mm -hmm. as a sort of ultimate axis of injustice. And that when you then look to go beyond that, how do you then avoid reproducing that with say, oh, well, actually, let's look at gender, let's look at race, let's look at that. And I think that, because um, I remember we had kind of been talking earlier about how how can approaching deindustrialization from a feminist perspective kind of seek to overcome that? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something that 
I, I try to think about and read as much as I can about um, is trying to trying to be as intersectional in my approach in my sort of methodological approach and when I'm doing my research as as I can mm -hmm. and to try and consider injustice and oppression as comprised of the interlocking as as being kind of comprised of this, to view gender race class and other identifying and kind of more conceptual categories as interlocking as systems of oppression if, if yeah, that makes a, yeah. any sense in, in in an attempt to kind of avoid prioritizing or essentializing one over the other to kind of actually look at more what is the relationship between these different kind of modes of oppression mm -hmm. and how they feed into each other um but i share exactly the same <laughs> anxieties as you Liam, all, all the time about um kind of falling into traps and reproducing the very kind of um ideas and stereotypes that i kind of see myself as trying to counter um yeah i i think i'll maybe pick up on a thread that you pulled uh amber which is the kind of feminist approach to you know deindustrialization and one you know small thing that i came that came out of my research is realizing that like deindustrialization at least in the textile industry and you know in a lot of the other industries that people study in our field happened at the same time as a lot of other social movements right like the the women's movement queer liberation etc and so i think that by yeah taking you know like a queer studies approach or a feminist approach to um to deindustrialization shows us that you know these social movements all you know had intersections with each other i mean one of i think the classic examples is the lesbian and gays support the minors of course um but i think there's also something to be said about the role that the women's movement played in you know supporting women's resistance to closures in the clothing industry that i've found in my um in my research but also actually how the women's movement meant that white women were able to move out of industrial work and that immigrant women then moved into these kind of, um, you know, other in, into industrial work um, and that when that was happening, that is also when the industry was declining. So I think that gives us looking through these other lenses allows us to notice other types of historical developments um, that are important for, for our studies, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Amanda. Uh, yeah, I think it's also going to be a matter of the body of work that is additive just growing so that when one starts to write or starts to engage with deindustrialization, they do not have to do it in a way that is first having to take the time uh, and kind of, you know, those like value that valuable word count to respond to and like make the claims about how they're doing it, uh, like either against or like as a response to these like more heavily masculinized stories. So like, I think that just like having the body of work uh, and being able to share it amongst ourselves and kind of be in community with people making work that is also more additive is going to be very helpful. Mm -hmm. And then also, I think just like giving people who have those direct experiences or um, who are from like more diverse back class backgrounds, just giving them money to go to school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they can study and can do those things and be in environments where um, that study and that work is encouraged, you know. Absolutely, and that, and that, of course, you know, one of the ways that we can encourage people to think about the overlap between uh, gender and class is 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 to think about studying, right, as a as a as a reproductive labor, um, both for families, for 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 the class, for society as a whole, and then therefore, you know, push for it to be remunerated as well. And so, um, so that's that's a that's a really great. Uh, Kind of last statement. Um, are there any questions from the audience in the in the kind of last going off? Did did you have a question or or no? Sorry, I see you. No. Okay. 
Uh, great, uh, it's fine. No one is obliged. Uh, uh, um, I want to thank you all uh, so much. Uh, it was a great conversation, and it was fun to be back here in the fourth space. And thanks to uh, fourth space for hosting us. Uh, thanks for um, thanks Amber for coming all the way from Scotland uh, <laughs> to, to to speak with us, and um, we look forward to uh, continuing this conversation. Uh, immediately after this, but also uh, more generally as Depot goes forward over the next, uh, I guess, five years now. So thanks a lot. Thank you for having me. Thank yeah. you. Yeah.